With a third wave of COVID and a third wave of lockdowns, does it feel like life is moving a little bit in slow motion? Hey folks, Tito here, keeping my ideas outside of the box. I don't know about you guys, but I really, really, really miss conventions. Around this time of year, we'd be coming back from Calgary Expo, and it's usually one of the biggest events of the year for us, mainly because of the panels, the cosplay, the food, the merch, and especially the cosplay music videos, which we film while we're down there. And that's the topic for the vlog this month. We get asked a lot while we're at conventions how we film our slow motion for our cosplay music videos. Now, if you guys were people that read our blog, you guys would know because it was actually one of our earlier posts. But for those of you that TLDR our blog, this is the vlog for you. The first and probably most expensive way that people shoot slow motion for their videos is by using an HFR camera, which stands for high frame rate. The way this is achieved is the camera normally films at a normal frame rate, but does these little bursts of ramped frames in order to achieve a slow motion look. Although expensive cinema cameras that have HFR do this best, you actually don't have to buy an expensive camera to do this. In fact, most people that use iPhones now already have it as a setting within their phones. You have an actual slow motion button where if you press it, it actually does that ramp up. It's why when you uh, record these clips, it'll start normally and then suddenly go into slow motion and then go back to normal after you end the recording. Essentially what it does is it ramps up for a brief period of time just so that you can get that slow motion. The downside of most high frame rate video is that it comes with a trade-off. Normally you'll see that the image while you're filming, the moment it starts becoming slower, it gets darker, which I'll get into a little bit later. And it also comes with a crop factor. And that's usually due to the fact that the camera actually has to crop the image in order to get the processing power in order to slow it down for you. So an ongoing joke in all filmmaking is we'll get it in post. But the truth of the matter is you can actually get slow motion in post. It's not the most recommended way of doing it, but it is possible and has gotten better over the years. So in most editing software, and I'm going to use Premiere as the example here, we can actually manipulate the speed of a clip and actually slow it down in order to get that slow motion effect. The only downside to this is it creates a choppy image and mainly because what's happening is the video is being slowed down so that you get frozen frames to make up for the frames that don't exist. So you're doubling up on frames and that gives you a bit of a choppy slow motion image. Not really the best for slow motion, especially if you want it to look really cinematic and smooth. And that's where third party plugins like Twixer come into play. These plugins essentially manipulate the footage to add additional transitional frames so that the slow motion looks a little bit smoother. Now these third party plugins do cost money and there's actually a better way to do it in Premiere. Instead of manipulating the speed of your footage, if you go into time interpolation and then set it into optical flow, what ends up happening is Premiere uses processing power in order to create transitional frames, the same as a third party plugin, and actually a little bit better because it's within Premiere itself. Unfortunately, this also comes with a downside and that is what's known as a ghosting effect. What happens is in order to kind of merge two frames together, you get what's known as a ghost between the two frames. And you'll see that mainly in bigger action things if you're trying to slow them down. So that's why you wanna kind of use this method sparringly and only when you have one or two subjects that you wanna move in slow motion, not a very busy scene. So we're finally here, my preferred method of doing slow motion. But in order to teach you it, I kind of have to show you guys or tell you guys a little bit about the history of frame rates in film. So first and foremost, film is expensive. So when the first movies were being made, filmmakers were trying to decide what is the least amount of film frames that we had to use in order to make fluid motion or human-like motion. It turns out that that frame rate was actually 10 to 12 frames per second. Uh, that's actually why silent films and some of the uh, I guess newer films before sound became a big thing look a little bit not choppy but quick and the main reason was because this was what they were getting away with in regards to oh this looks like a moving real image uh, but still we're saving some uh, frames uh, in order to actually not have to develop as much in post. This all changed when sound was introduced into the mix. They had to find a steady frame rate so that sound could be synced with movement so that people could talk on frame. 
and that ended up being 24 frames per second or 25 frames per second if you're out in the UK. Um, that is actually why we have that standard. That is what we consider cinematic movement. And this was the standard for the longest time, but with the advent of television and live programming, including sports, cameras would begin filming at 60 interlaced frames per second, which would then be presented at 30 frames per second. The idea being we would be able to capture more movement on film for sporting events or even have live replays, which we would eventually have on television. This also introduced a new concept, which was later called the soap opera effect. If you've noticed, television looks different from movies. And the main reason for this is this frame rate. Essentially, things look a bit too real in 30 frames per second, whereas a cinematic image, which is 24 frames per second, has an aesthetically pleasing blur effect that we've all become accustomed to. On a subconscious level, we can tell the difference between 24 and 30 frames per second. And the same is true for a newer standard that would come with VR and video games, 60 frames per second. 60 frames per second sounds great, because it can actually capture more precise movements, especially if you're playing like a first person shooter, all these reaction time elements mean something to you. But when watching a movie, it actually can throw us off. One example is Peter Jackson's The Hobbit, which was filmed at 48 frames per second. And a lot of people thought that this actually attributed to an almost cosplay effect in the costume department of this movie. A more recent example is Ang Lee's Gemini Man, where some of the action sequences, because the movie was filmed in 60 frames per second, felt slower. So how does all this frame rate information relate to slow motion? Well, essentially, higher frame rates equal slow motion. It's essentially the principle of more frames going through the camera gate in order to have a slowdown effect per second. So in other words, if you had 60 frames per second and then you slowed it down to 24 frames per second, you have a slowdown factor of two and a half times. This is also why you need more light to film slow motion. Essentially because you have a higher frame rate, you need more light to compensate and have the scene lit the same as it would be for 24 frames per second. If you're using a DSLR, you also have to consider having double the shutter speed as your frame rate. And this comes down to something known as the 180 degree rule. Old cameras, the way they captured light was with a half moon shape that would go across the gate, allowing a certain amount of light to hit each piece of film. Essentially what this meant was that 180 degrees of a full circle had to be covered. And that's what you're actually mimicking in a DSLR when you're trying to achieve this look. Now, can you film uh, by not doubling the shutter speed on your camera. Yes, you can, but it comes with some considerations. What will end up happening is you have half frames and another kind of choppy ghosting effect as a result of it in your slow motion. Now, a lot of modern cameras already have settings for 180 degree filming, so you don't really have to think about it. But if you are using a DSLR, it is something you have to take into account. If you're filming 24 frames per second, you may want to set your shutter speed to 1 over 48 or 1 over 50, whichever comes closest on your settings. So let's say you did everything right and you filmed at 60 frames per second and you have this amazing slow motion footage that you want to play with in post. So the first thing you need to consider is the fact that you need to import that footage as 24 frames per second in order to get that slow motion effect. Essentially what it comes down to is you want your computer or your program to interpret the footage as normal footage, but because it has those extra frames, it's going to look like slow motion. So your sequence timeline should be at 24 frames per second while your footage is 60 frames per second. Now, it's not enough to just drop the footage in. You actually have to right click and reinterpret the footage as 24 frames as well. Once you do this, you'll notice in your timeline that the footage is insanely slow, or at least 2.5 times slow. One thing that we like to do with this is play with both slow motion and regular footage. What we do is we duplicate a clip, one of them 60 frames per second, and the other one interpreted as 24 frames per second, and then we cut between them to make this really cool ramp up and then ramp down effect for the slow motions, making each shot feel that much more Zack Snyder cinematic-ish. And that's it. And one thing, amongst all the other one things to keep in mind during this whole process, so another thing to keep in mind during this entire process is that slow motion should be used sparringly. The idea is that things look cool in slow motion, but you want them to be impactful. Not everything needs to be in slow motion. Speaking of being impactful, there's still 75% of you guys that watch our videos and aren't subscribed. If you were to subscribe, you could get this content the moment it comes out and really help us in regards to making more of this type of content for you. And until next time, this is Tito saying, learn to be professional, but keep that indie passion.